July 12, 1965, KGW Broadcast Center is being formally dedicated in Portland, Oregon. Gathered tonight in Studio A of KGW Television are over 200 distinguished ladies and gentlemen, guests of the King Broadcasting Company. Here tonight to participate in our dedicatory ceremonies and to hear a special address by Mr. Chet Huntley of NBC News. Seated at the head table for tonight's banquet are Mr. Pat Crafton, station manager of KGW Radio. Mr. Robert Y. Thornton, Attorney General for the State of Oregon. Mr. Walter Wagstaff, Station Manager of KGW Television. Mr. Tom Lawson McCall, Secretary of State of the State of Oregon. Mrs. A. Scott Bullock. Chairman of the Board of the King Broadcasting Company. Mr. Chet Huntley of NBC News. Mr. Ansel Payne, Vice President and General Manager of KGW Radio and Television. Mr. Stimson Bullock. President of the King Broadcasting Company. Mr. Robert Straub, State Treasurer of the State of Oregon. Mr. Jay Wright, Vice President Engineering of King Broadcasting Company. Mr. Terry Schrunk, Mayor of the City of Portland. Mr. Otto Brandt. Executive Vice President of the King Broadcasting Company. I am pleased to introduce the President of the King Broadcasting Company, Mr. Stimson Bullet. No one saw it. I didn't break the chair. And Mr. Payne, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. We in this room have been privileged to dine with Mr. Chet Huntley, the distinguished journalist. And now we shall share with uh, the KGW audience the further privilege of hearing him speak. And we listen to him because he has the qualities needed in a man who explains to other people what is happening in the world. First, he knows a good deal about it all. His knowledge derives from long observation at good vantage point, combined with the practice of doing his homework, uh, informing and uh, educating himself year by year. Second, a mind not only well filled, but orderly and clear. A third asset is good judgment the capacity for accurate measurement of probabilities, probable outcome of events, and uh, probable conduct of men. From this, of course, flows the capacity to select for attention that which is important. Fourth, he has held on to the, this is very, very close to third, he has held on to the element of uh, perspective, a sense of proportion, an element of judgment. The retention, owing partly to a lack of excessive vanity and in part to a sense of responsibility as a journalist whose profession has become uh, informally but uh, uh, nonetheless, uh, uh, in fact, a branch of government. 
the sense of responsibility serves in turn, uh, tends in turn to resist the seductions of uh, popularity and great influence, uh, which of course uh, are the very things which create uh, the fact of responsibility. Last and most fundamental, because all else depend on them, he has blessed himself with honesty and courage. Honesty to recognize the truth as real and relevant and right and courage to tell it. Now the pleasure of introducing uh, Mr. Huntley is offset by the discomfort uh, of being contrasted with such an able speaker. However, the honor of doing so remains. Mr. Huntley. Thank you, Mr. Bullock. Mrs. Bullock, distinguished public servants, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen, and friends of KGW. I am inclined to observe, sir, that some people will do anything for a laugh. <laughs> I broke my leg. <laughs> a newsman is in, uh, is in peculiar circumstances and situations these days. Sometimes we have a feeling in this complicated society in which we live and in a dangerous world that uh, is there, we ask ourselves, is there a conviction that we can arrive at and hold on to firmly without doubt that it's ever going to fail or collapse? And it's something like the old story of a Catholic priest and a Protestant minister the setting is in some rural town in mid-America, and over the years, these two had become rather fast and warm friends, and they used to sit on each other's front porches on warm summer evenings and rock back and forth and discourse, and I suppose indulge in a bit of community gossip. And one night, the Protestant <clears throat> minister turned to his friend, the Catholic priest, and said, Father, I want to say to you, after <clears throat> this long time, how much I have come to appreciate and value this rewarding and fast friendship that has sprung up between us. Here we are of different and alas sometimes of competing faiths, but nevertheless I have found this association rewarding and stimulating and fruitful, and I thank you. The Catholic priest contemplated his friend for a moment and said finally, well sir, he said I reciprocate. I too have come to value this warm and wonderful friendship which has developed between the two of us. But after all, isn't it true, my friend, that we are both in the service of the Lord, you in your way, and I in his? <laughs> we in journalism in uh, the, the middle of this, this century somehow can never maintain our convictions quite that strenuously, it seems. It's good to be home. It's good to be out west. Indeed, I do have roots here. And by the way, I don't want to embarrass you, Travis Cross, but I do know that I bring a consensus from all my compatriots from the eastern seaboard, all of us in press and radio and television, who would be delighted to send you their their highest and warmest regard. And I don't know whether you fellow citizens of Mr. Cross's realize it or not, but this man is regarded as the epitome of his profession in the East. The finest news or press secretary that a man ever had. <laughs> Who can get the work done for you and yet no nonsense and no propaganda and gives you an honest answer. 
I wonder by any chance if you people too are aware of some of the image that Oregon has on the East Coast. The physical image is certainly there. You mention Oregon and the, the vision is immediately created of a land of water and green trees and mountains and not overcrowded with some open space and clean, brilliant, wine-like stimulating air. There is a, an image which has to do with the education system, which this state, I think, has developed, and there's a little story in that respect. I finally persuaded my two daughters to try a very fine Eastern girls' school. The academic standards were high, and all oh, the social standards were much higher. And they finally consented after much persuasion. But after one semester, they said, no, we can't take it. So I said, well, where do you want to go? They said, University of Oregon. I said, why the University of Oregon? <laughs> so they said, well, we think it's the best school in the United States. So they came to the University of Oregon. There is something special about Oregon politics. A few of our states in the Union have this unique quality in political life. Oregon is certainly one of them. I think Kentucky is another. Minnesota is another. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's the way the primary election uh, is conducted. Maybe it's the laws that are on your statute book governing your primary election. You'll notice that all these, these three states I mentioned, Kentucky, Minnesota, and Oregon, have primaries which are similar and laws which are similar governing that primary. But in any event, I need not remind you that the primary election in the state of Oregon is one of the great political factors in every presidential year. And it would be my guess that it's going to remain so. The timing is propitious. It is well contested. The size of the state is about right. The population is about right. It's a pleasant place to come to. The facilities, the communication facilities are good. And so each four years, we, uh, we get this business all over again. What are we going to do about a better way to nominate a president? We want no more uh, conventions where the candidate comes and he has all the candidate's votes in his back pocket, and it's a, it's a foregone conclusion. And there's a lot of disgust, and you hear a clamor each four years about, oh, perhaps a national primary or some other way to nominate a candidate, it would be my suggestion that a few states should be chosen as primary battlegrounds, and the federal government should pay a part of the expense of this business rather than having the state and the poor candidates go to all of it. But in any event, Oregon would certain quali certainly qualify as one where a pri presidential primary must be held. If you will forgive me, I would like to reminisce a moment. I came here virtually out of the University of Washington, uh, much younger than I am at this moment. Indeed, I, I shudder to think this was 30 years ago, almost. And I went to work for KGW. I remember covering the Portland Rose Festival with that week of fun and, and beauty and spectacle. <clears throat> I remember the, covering the great Portland livestock show. I remember the Pendleton Roundup, which KGW covered each year. I remember a festival, I believe it was, with, it was, it was at Oregon City called Pioneer Days. And I, I don't know whether that festival or whether that holiday still exists or not. But I, if I'm not mistaken, it was down at Oregon City, and it was called uh, Pioneer Days. In 1936 and 1937, the Reed College students, I dare say, were just as bright and just as angry. <laughs> as a matter of fact, I often think that the, that the Reed College students were the first angry young men and women in the United States. <laughs> Palmer Hoyt was editor of the Oregonian. The Oregonian was perhaps somewhat more Republican in 1936 <coughs> than it is today, if that's possible. 
I, I think it finally came around after 1932 to live with the election results of that year by rationalizing a bit and calling it an inexplicable aberration on the part of the American people. <laughs> but when in 1936 the American people did it all over again, that was just too much. <laughs> Spike Hennessy was uh, the editorial, or was the political reporter. I used to go out on assignments with him. As a matter of fact, I remember going with Spike down to the opening of the 1937 legislature in Salem. You had a governor at that time, an old retired army general by the name of Governor Martin, who could swear, I think he was the world's champion. <laughs> and uh, Spike told me on the way down, now you've got to get with him and remind him that he's going to be on radio and he's he, he just can't use foul language. Well, I said, sure, he can't use foul language, but how am I going to convince him? He said, well, talk to him. So he got in there, and I talked to him all morning, and he took a vow that he would behave himself. We went on the air, and in the first sentence, he was gone. They had to... <laughs> the state of Oregon heard the opening sentence, and that, that was too much. The Tillamook fire occurred that year, and we covered that. I don't know how we had an engineer at KGW by the name of Red Sanders. And of course, you couldn't use recordings in those days. Well, as a matter of fact, there was no such thing as a portable recorder. You had to stretch lines out and get the lines there and do it live. And how Red Sanders ever got lines into the Tillamook fire, I shall never know. I think he connected batteries to barbed wire fences, as a matter of fact, and finally got the signal in, but never, in any event, we broadcast from the scene of the Tillamook fire. I believe, as a matter of fact, that series of broadcasts won some awards. Then uh, I was eligible for a vacation in the spring, or I, it was about June 1937. I took my vacation, and wouldn't you know, my luck uh, was running uh, uh, normally. And one of the great stories of all time broke the next day, or the day after I left. A Russian aviator landed right here on the, out here on the banks of the Columbia River. And I heard it uh, down someplace down in Sacramento, California, and almost came back, but uh, it was no use. The people around KGW, the names of many of them I shall never forget, Bill Ross, Bob Tomlinson, Raleigh Truitt, he used to broadcast the baseball game. Phil Irwin, alas, who is gone. Phil Irwin was one of the most magnificent voices I've ever heard in my life. Eddie King, who is now in Hollywood. Homer Welch. Don Neath. Jack Little, who I know is now in Australia. A wonderful girl by the name of Mary Bullock. A. Berkowitz a wonderful violinist and warm human being and fine musician. A boy by the name of Barney Miller and Jack White and so many, many more. I dare say that some of these people may be working for competitive radio and television stations by this date, but after all, we can be magnanim magnanimous and generous this evening. <laughs> it was that year, 1937, in which I was summoned to the controller's office or one of the offices at KGW or in the Oregonian building, and I was handed a card. And I have it right here in my back pocket, in my back pocket, in my wallet, and it was my social security card. I still bear it, and we wondered at the time, what is this social security business? What is it? It was something brand new, the law had just been passed, and we were issued our card. I think by now, we are certainly all well aware of what the Social Security card is. KGW. Those are honorable letters. It's an honorable set of call letters. As early as 1933, 1934, perhaps as early as 1932. It is my opinion that this radio station, KGW, was broadcasting more news and public affairs <clears throat> than any station in the United States. We fellows who worked in news at KGW were constantly on the go. We were out on the streets and pounding the pavements. And I am quite certain that KGW did more news and public affairs broadcasting than any radio station in the country. 
Also, KGW for years, I would remind any NBC or ex-NBC personnel here supplied virtually all of NBC San Francisco with its personnel. And the time they needed the new man, uh, NBC usually came to KGW Portland for him. So this new facility which we dedicate here this evening is dedicated to the service of its constituency. It's dedicated to speaking clearly and intelligently and not just loudly. We Americans require all the clarification and information we can get at this particular time in our history. We live in a time and a climate when I fear there are few tidy and clean and neat answers or formulas to dilemmas and problems. We're overwhelmed with new data and information. We are nonplussed by new problems. We're sometimes confused and provoked by new enemies, new exercises and new challenges. And we are frequently tempted by political pied pipers and just plain political nuts who urge us to follow them to some never-never land and wander off over the horizon and commit political harakiri. We have world peace to construct. We have armaments to control and the atom to tame. We have population to rationalize, hunger to assuage, and disease to eradicate, poverty to eliminate. We have land and water and forests and fish in the very air we breathe to conserve and care for. We have our youngsters to counsel and educate. We have a system of self-government to protect and improve. We have a very dream, if you please, to realize. The facilities which we inaugurate here this evening, I am sure, will play their role in making it possible for us to make all these decisions on the basis of responsible information, KGW is aware that we now have these miraculous devices and machines of communication. But the machines aren't enough. It is also aware, KGW is aware, that what is said now becomes terribly important, particularly when the machines perform and function so well to underscore the point that there are no easy and ready-made answers to these dilemmas and problems, let me tell this quick story. I was in Britain in 1949 on an assignment for another network, which will be nameless. And at that time, state medicine was just coming into being in Britain. And they were telling a story which, to my knowledge, has never had complete circulation here. A British housewife got up one morning with a queasy, un uneasy notion that she might be uh, going to have a baby. So she got an appointment with a new state doctor and was there on the appointed day and at the given hour and waited some time in the ante room and was finally beckoned in. And he gave her a rather brief and most abrupt and cursory examination, gave her no counsel, no advice, no prescription, no setting up exercises. All he did was stamp her on the stomach with something. And she was so startled and taken aback that she didn't protest on the spot, but by the time her husband got home that evening, she was in high dudgeon. And he said, what's wrong? She said, well, that fool doctor gave me no prescription, no advice, no counsel, no exercises. All he did was stamp me on the stomach. And he said, well, what is the stamp? She said, I don't know. It's upside down. I can't read it. So he said, well, let me have a look. So he looked, and he said, well, there's some fine print there. I can't read it. She said, get the reading glass. So he trained it on her abdomen and then said, when you can read this with a naked eye, get to a hospital. <laughs> So there are no rubber stamp formulas or answers to some of these problems. We've, we've just simply got to use our intelligence and our skill and apply common sense and knowledge and, and wallow through. And now I think I should uh, terminate this speech because there is always a risk that uh, someone will apply to me what William Gibbs McAdoo once said about Warren G. Harding. He said, his speeches leave the impression of an army of pompous phrases moving over the landscape in search of an idea.
Sometimes these meandering words would actually capture a straggling thought and bear it triumphantly prisoner in their midst until it died of servitude and overwork. <laughs> Thank you very much. custom nor wisdom causes anyone to follow Chet Huntley with anything other than thank you and good night. <laughs>